Blocking to the back, or back blocks, are pretty simple to describe. Someone performs a block into the illegal target zone on an opponent's back. Relative position changes because of said block, and penalty is issued. It's pretty simple on paper, and on the whole, is pretty simple. There are, of course, areas where things aren't quite as straightforward as they appear on paper, hence this presentation. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. This presentation was originally created on September 6, 2015. Edits were made on February 22, 2017 for the 2017 Rules of Flat Track Roller Derby. So, let's start with the basics. A block to the back is a block that occurs in the illegal target zone along the target player's back, which includes the buttocks. If you're first starting out, it can be difficult to reconcile that you can actively block with your butt, but your butt cannot be a target. Someone counter-blocking a booty block directly into the derriere may not normally cause a change of position, but if it does, then there's a penalty that should be issued. Similarly, like most penalties that involve a physical action as opposed to a technical infraction, relative position can play into it. If a player back blocks an opponent, doesn't take her position, but instead lets a teammate take that player's position, then we still have a blocking to the back penalty. One of the easiest examples is a bookend, where on a jam start, a player is able to get at one side of her opponent's wall and push them out of the way, allowing her jammer to easily pass. An effective tactic, as long as it's done legally. The bookend is... Not the only example, of course, but probably the easiest to spot since it takes place at the very start of a jam. Let's look at some examples where making the decision between call and no call can be more difficult with back blocks. And the biggest stumbling block, the item that causes referees to make more incorrect back block calls than any other, involves initiation. Initiation, of course, is the most basic concept in roller derby penalties, and if you're not familiar with it, I strongly suggest you either read up on it or check out the initiation module on refed.com, as I won't be going into any great detail here. But initiation is, in a nutshell, who did the last action to make sure the contact happened the way it did. There are two things I think of when it comes to messing up initiation calls when it comes to back blocks. The first is the skater who, at the last moment, exposes her back just before an opponent makes contact. In this situation, you have to decide on the call not just on where the contact was, but who made the last action. Let's say, for example, that blocker A telegraphed her intended block and moved from one side of the track to another, and then blocker B turned her back prior to the block. Blocker A will and does make contact with blocker B's back, but before we issue the penalty, we need to decide, was there reasonable time and opportunity for blocker A to avoid the back? If the answer is yes, then we should go ahead and issue the back block. If the answer is no, there should be no call. So how do we define reasonable? That's the $10 million question. The answer is, Use your best judgment. I would say this. I think it is acceptable to make allowances for the game you're officiating, although not for individual players. 
to clarify, a high-level sanctioned game between two playoff-caliber teams may have a shorter distance between action and expected reaction than the B teams of two brand new leagues. I wouldn't, however, make allowances for individual skaters in order to keep the calls consistent throughout the game. But that's just my own opinion. The second biggest issue with initiation and back blocks has to do with jammers running into other skaters at high rates of speed and picking up erroneous back block calls. I talked about this briefly in the inside pack ref positioning module, but to recap, if the jammer is going through packs quickly, the jammer referee may not always have the ability to see the entire action by the blockers. So it becomes the pack ref's responsibility to communicate to the jammer referee if a blocker changes their position in such a way that would negate a back block call against that jammer. Remember that if the jammer can't reasonably establish her position elsewhere or stop before the collision, then by definition, the blocker is actually blocking the jammer, not the other way around. Another issue that frequently causes stirs when it comes to blocks from behind is when the block is at the opponent's back but still in a legal target zone. Pause this video for a moment and look again at the target zones in the rules. There is a small strip on either side as the side target moves into the back that is still a legal target zone. The illegal area is often described as between the bra straps, but outside those bra straps is still a portion of the back that is legally targetable. The most common hit to those areas are by jammers during scrum starts. They frequently purposefully aim between two blockers, which puts them in that slim legal target zone on each player's back in order to push between them. Sometimes you'll also see this not in a scrum, but in the middle of play and at higher speeds, which makes me want to stress something very important. We do not penalize big hits. I've seen some players barrel in at top speed and land right into that legal target zone, as small as it is, sending one or more players flying. And it is inevitable that someone will come in thinking that is a back block. And it's possible it may be. Part of our job is to determine if that block was in a legal target zone or not. But please, don't judge the legality of the hit by the veracity of the hit. However, if the hit was illegal, could you consider it for expulsion? Yes, you could. In 2017, the rules greatly simplified the definition of expulsions to illegal actions that were physically violent or, quote, deemed by the officials to cause extraordinary physical threat to others, unquote. Like with the 2017 change in how referees could judge the impact of an illegal action, this is very similar. If it's illegal and that action did or could have caused, remember the rules say physical threat, a swing and a miss is still physically violent and still a physical threat. You can judge it worthy of expulsion. But, and you'll hear me say this a lot in these modules, if you're going to expel someone, you absolutely need to explain the reasoning behind your expulsions, both to the captains and on the expulsion paperwork. The skater blindsided the victim with a fist to the back of her neck is pretty simple, but with a back block expulsion, you'll need to explain what else went into it to make it so egregious as to warrant removal from the game. In a sport where people's backs are frequently, if not continually exposed, it's inevitable that contact to them occurs. And despite us being the rather sturdy creatures we are, an injury to the back can have devastating consequences. And I don't mean devastating in the overused and incorrect way we hear so often, the, that was a devastating hit, sort of way. I'm talking about the permanent injury devastation, the, the kind that changes a life forever. Sometimes freak accidents occur that can do this but it's also part of our jobs as referees to make sure that the games stay within a bounds that 
do not endanger other skaters unreasonably. If they put themselves in danger, that's their business. But if they put others in danger, then it becomes ours. It's one of the reasons behind the change in philosophy that makes major impact and penalties less rigid. Before I jump onto the pre-recorded thank yous and plugs, I want to make one other suggestion. We frequently see a lot of GoFundMe and similar sites raising money for derby teams to travel or to help with injuries. When I started writing this module, I couldn't help but think about Tequila Mockingbird, who had a devastating spinal injury in 2007. She's one of modern roller derby's earliest players and paid a heavy price for it. So please consider sending a few dollars her way. You can get more information about her by going to helptequila.com. I'd like to thank Quicken Derby for permission to use his photographs in this presentation. I'd also like to thank the Minnesota Roller Girls for letting me use their practice space, as well as Dr. Sorters, Miss Behaven, and Wolf Bite for modeling my photos. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.